A young woman was found dead in her own apartment. The police began an investigation that eventually became the longest in the district for years. The case had many shocking twists and turns, but it was only 46 years later that the unexpected truth was revealed. Lindy Sue Beekler was born on January 31, 1956, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. When she was young, her parents divorced and she stayed with her mother. Her father started a new family but continued to see his daughter regularly. Soon, he had a son with whom Lindy was in constant communication. After school, she enrolled at Millersville University, a state college located just 10 minutes from home. At the age of 19, Lindy met a man named Philip Beekler and the couple soon married. He also attended courses at the college while working for a car rental company. Lindy herself worked part-time at a local flower shop. After the wedding, they rented an apartment in the Manor Township Residential Complex just a few minutes from the college. The newlyweds began their life together and were happy with each other. However, almost immediately after moving in, Lindy's happiness was overshadowed by a series of unpleasant events. She began to notice that someone was constantly watching her in this residential complex, but she never managed to see who it could be. The young woman often complained to friends and relatives, but they attributed what was happening to stress after the move. One evening, when Lindy was home alone, she noticed a man looking at her through the glass door inserts. The apartment was on the first floor and her husband was at work at the time. The man immediately disappeared, leaving Lindy terrified. Since then, the young woman was afraid to be alone at home, but due to Philip's evening schedule, she often had to be alone until it was dark. Lindy was constantly stressed and any incident could bring her to panic. Soon after this event, she spent time with her brother and his family at their home when they heard the sound of breaking glass from the second floor. It turned out that a wall mirror had fallen to the floor and shattered. The young woman was so scared that she started shaking. She asked her relatives to go around the whole house and make sure that no one else had broken in. All this stress was the result of the fact that that some unknown man had been watching her for several months. But all of her acquaintances still believed that the young woman was overreacting and that nothing serious was happening to her. On December 5, 1975, Lindy finished her shift at a flower shop and stopped by her husband's workplace before heading to a local store to do some shopping. Around the same time, her aunt and uncle went to their son's basketball game and decided to invite Lindy along as they knew she was afraid to be alone at home and wanted to distract her for a few hours. They arrived at her apartment at around 8.45 p.m. Lindy's aunt approached the door and found it open, which immediately alarmed her. She went inside and saw a knocked-over lamp in the living room, but the worst was waiting for her in the kitchen. Lindy's body lay there. She was laying face down with no signs of life and a meat cleaver with a towel wrapped around its handle was found in her neck. Lindy's aunt immediately called the police and detectives began investigating the crime scene. The first thing they noticed was that Lindy was fully dressed, which cast doubt on the mode of being related to rape. Additionally, no valuables were missing from the apartment, ruling out robbery as a possibility. There were no signs of forced entry on the front door or windows, suggesting that Lindy either knew her attacker and let them in voluntarily, or the attacker entered the apartment when the door was left unlocked. The fact that Lindy had purchased a lot of groceries and physically couldn't have carried all the bags from the parking lot to her apartment in one go suggests that her killer may have entered the apartment just after she had taken the first load inside and gone back to her car for the second. While the police were investigating the crime scene, Lindy's husband and parents were informed of what had happened. The grieving family members were desperate to see Lindy and had to be restrained by detectives. Forensic investigators found blood stains on the floor and walls, but DNA testing was not available at the time, so they could not compare these samples to Lindy's DNA. 
They did conclude that Lindy had put up a fight with her attacker. A male shoe print was found in one of the rooms, and medical experts determined that Lindy had received 19 blows from a sharp object. The perpetrator had used two weapons, the meat cleaver from Lindy's kitchen and a second weapon, presumably a knife, that was never found. Later, it was confirmed that Lindy had indeed been sexually assaulted, but DNA evidence could not be extracted from the crime scene. At the time, DNA testing was not advanced enough to be of much help in solving the case. The police had hoped to find witnesses, but none of their neighbors were home at the time of the murder. Other residents did not notice anything suspicious. However, several people reported seeing a car parked in the residential complex parking lot from around 7 p.m. to 8.40 p.m., which coincided with the time of Lindy's murder. Additionally, none of the residents knew the owner of the car. Unfortunately, detectives were unable to locate it and switch to another line of investigation. As is often the case in such situations, the victim's husband became a suspect. Despite Philip being at work and having a solid alibi, investigators did not rule out his possible involvement. Over the next few months, detectives interviewed about 300 people who could have been involved in the murder, but all of it yielded no results. At some point, they began to suspect a local serial rapist who had committed several attacks on women around the same time Lindy was killed. However, they were unable to find any evidence linking him to the case, and the culprit himself died during an attempt to escape from prison. Moreover, investigators found out that at the time of the murder, he was at work, and eventually, they stopped considering him as a suspect. Four months after the murder, there was a new twist in the case. A 43-year-old woman named Mary was killed 25 kilometers away from Lindy's apartment. She received multiple stab wounds, and the detectives immediately noted that these murders were almost 100% similar. But soon the culprit was caught, and investigators could not find any connection between him and Lindy. The man admitted to killing Mary, but denied involvement in the other crimes. After that, the police had no leads, and the case went cold for a year. On December 26, 1976, Lindy's relatives went to visit her grave at the local cemetery. Upon arriving, they saw that the gravestone was covered in red paint and heavily scratched. They immediately reported it to the police, but they were unable to find the vandals. Investigators concluded that the perpetrator of the desecration may have been Lindy's killer, as no other graves were damaged. The nature of the damage also supported this theory as the criminal clearly harbored animosity towards the deceased in addition to the obvious association with the red paint. By using a knife or sharp object, the perpetrator had to have spent a considerable amount of time damaging the stone in order to completely cover it with deep scratches. Just a few weeks later, something even stranger happened. Chief Donald W. Scheller, whose department was investigating Lindy's murder, received an anonymous two-page letter. The first part was written from the perspective of the killer who taunted the police for not being able to catch him yet. The author took responsibility for the vandalism of Lindy's grave and demanded that the letter be published in the next day's local newspapers. In exchange, the anonymous writer promised to consider surrendering to the police. He then went on to provide several characteristics to help investigators identify him, claiming to be 178 centimeters tall, weighing 93 kilograms, living in the western suburbs of Lancaster, having a good job, being single, and having been caught a few years earlier for possession of illegal substances. On the day of the murder, he was also under the influence of drugs. The last part of the letter was a plea for help, with the unknown author asking to be caught before he killed anyone else. The second page was a separate letter allegedly written by the killer's friend named Jenny Scrum. She wrote that her acquaintance truly intended to surrender once his letter was published in the newspapers and added that the man was mentally ill. 
She purportedly added this message while he was sleeping before placing both sheets in an envelope. Police believed that the author could indeed be Lindy's killer, but they did not believe the second part about his friend Jenny. Despite being written in a different handwriting, investigators believe that the perpetrator may have asked someone he knew to write it or use some other method to forge the handwriting. They also failed to notice the similarity of this message to the letter sent by a serial killer nicknamed the Zodiac Killer, who operated in California in the 60s and 70s, regularly communicating with the police and newspapers through anonymous text messages. Investigators even considered that he might have been responsible for Lindy's murder. However, this theory was highly stretched. Firstly, the killer was operating on the opposite side of the country. Secondly, by the time Lindy was killed, according to the police, the Zodiac killer had already stopped his killings. Chief Donald W. Scheller decided not to publish the letter in the newspaper as the author requested. At that time, the police had two suspects and they did not want to compromise the investigation. Detectives did not believe that the culprit would surrender and saw no point in scarring residents with a letter from a madman. Eventually, they began to doubt that the author was actually Lindy's killer. The letter did not contain any details that had not already appeared in the newspapers. The police profiler even suggested that the author of both sheets could be a mentally ill woman who had no connection to the case. He made this conclusion after analyzing the writing style. Despite this, investigators located a woman named Jenny Scrum and, after talking to her, concluded that she had nothing to do with these letters. From that moment on, the police had no serious leads, but they continued to investigate the case. At various stages, they had new suspects. Lindy's mother's partner, a regular visitor to the flower shop where she worked, and even one of the investigators on the case. After brief checks, detectives came to the conclusion that none of them were involved in the murder. In 1980, the police had another chance to solve the case. In Florida, they arrested serial killer Gerald Stano, who admitted to killing 41 people. At the time of Lindy's death, his father lived just 10 minutes away from her complex, so detectives considered the possibility that Stano might have been the killer, but they could not find any evidence that the man visited his father and soon stopped considering him as a suspect. In 1997, experts were able to extract a male DNA profile, discovering traces of semen on the victim's underwear. This sample did not match any of the suspects that investigators had for 23 years. Since then, the police have not had any significant leads, and the case went cold. It was reviewed in 2000, but with no results in the same year, detectives decided to publish a letter in newspapers, supposedly written by the killer, hoping it would help them get new leads, but it didn't. Lindy's parents never found out the truth about her murder, Lindy's father passed away in 2000 and her mother in 2007. The next major breakthrough only occurred in 2019 after the case was reopened again. Investigators decided to turn to a private laboratory called Parabon Nanolabs, which specializes in genetic research and has helped solve similar cases in the past. Using an innovative method called DNA phenotyping, Experts were able to create an approximate portrait of Lindy's killer at the ages of 25 and 60. This method works by studying the criminal's DNA sample and finding information about possible physical traits, such as skin color, eye color, hair color, and so on. Such portraits often turn out to be very similar to real DNA holders, although there are exceptions. The killer's portraits were widely distributed through the media. Investigators hoped someone would recognize this man, but in the end, they didn't get any serious leads. A year later, they turned to Parabon Nanolabs again, this time to use the method of genetic genealogy. This is also a relatively new method that allows experts to find possible relatives of any person based on their DNA. Investigators provided them with a genetic sample from Lindy's killer and waited. 
The main drawback of this method is the incredible complexity of the research. Experts have to study thousands of people, eliminating unsuitable candidates until they finally find a relative of the DNA holder. After many months of hard work, they were able to find a person who was distantly related to the killer. He turned out to be a resident of Italy, and now investigators could begin to examine his family tree. They were looking for a man who was in the USA in 1975 and lived near Lancaster. To do this, they had to locate and question a huge number of relatives. In Lancaster alone, there were 2,500 people related to the killer by distant kinship. In 2022, the detectives finally found a suitable candidate, 68-year-old David Sinopoli, a man who had never come to the attention of the police in connection with the case. In 1975, he lived in the same complex as the victim, so he immediately became the main suspect. To confirm or refute his involvement, detectives needed to secretly obtain a DNA sample. To do this, they began to follow David, waiting for the right moment. On February 11th, they had such an opportunity. The man flew out to the airport in Philadelphia and, before boarding the flight, threw a paper coffee cup into a bin. The investigators took it and handed it over to the laboratory. Experts extracted his DNA sample and compared it with the semen DNA found on Lindy's underwear. The analysis showed a complete match. David was the killer. He was arrested on July 17, 2022, and is currently awaiting trial. At the time of Lindy's murder, he was 21 years old. He moved into the residential complex a year before the victim moved there with her husband. David was married twice in 1972 and 1987. According to available information, he did not have children. He spent most of his life working at a printing press in a local printing house, and his colleagues were shocked that their good acquaintance turned out to be a ruthless killer. David is now in custody, and additional details will only emerge after the start of the trial. But even now, there is virtually no doubt that he is the killer. Experts also compared his DNA to the blood found in the victim's apartment, and the analysis showed a complete match. Lindy's ex-husband and brother thank the investigators for being able to uncover the truth, and now the guilty party will be punished. Thus, this complex and convoluted case was solved with the help of innovative technologies almost 47 years later. Genetic genealogy is a unique tool that allows the police to find perpetrators based on the tiniest DNA samples stored for half a century. Share your opinion in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.